All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Marisha Winkels, and today I'm going to be talking to you about data-centric AI, and more specifically, why you should care about it. Um, I'm also going to explain a little bit about what data-centric AI is, and just tell you some anecdotes of how I've encountered it or use it in practice. And a little bit about myself. Uh, I work for GoData Driven, and at GoData Driven, I'm a data science educator. And that means that I give or teach data science trainings to anyone who's willing to listen and pay. Uh, being a data science educator um, got me thinking about how I was taught data science and machine learning in the first place. So I studied artificial intelligence at the University of Amsterdam. And when I was taught machine learning, it was very focused on the algorithms, very focused on the models. So the first thing we did during our machine learning course was study this book by Bishop. It's called Pattern Recognition and Machine Learning, and it's very heavy on math and equations. It gives you a great, deep understanding of the underlying math, underlying all the algorithms, but it's not necessarily very practical. So to get a little bit more practical, we had to implement the algorithms ourselves. So I built my own SVMs, I built my own neural networks, and we then applied them on some data set. I don't even remember what data set it was, probably the IRIS data set. But I studied the algorithms, I implemented the algorithms, and then to get a little bit better understanding of how to use it, I practiced on, to uh, on toy data sets. So this uh, I did mostly with Kaggle to get a bit more familiarity with the common packages. I practiced on data sets by Kaggle. I think uh, many of you will recognize the Titanic data set here. There's actually a newer version called Spaceship Titanic, which is very similar, very beginner-friendly, but about uh, passengers who were transported to a different uh, dimension. But this was my personal journey of how I learned machine learning and data science. And not everyone has the chance to study this in university, but still, many people follow a sort of similar process. Maybe they don't implement the algorithms themselves, but whenever you look at online courses, boot camps, etc., it's mostly focused on the algorithms. We see here that at these Coursera courses, the skills you learn are logistic regression, neural networks, etc. So that got me thinking, now I work as a data scientist, um, a common thing to say is that 80% of the effort that we as data scientists put into our projects is about data cleaning or data preparation, and only 20% is about the models. So if machine learning is 20% modeling and 80% or the majority of our time is spent on data preparation, why is data preparation not taught? Why is there such little focus on the practicalities of dealing with our data? Well, data scientists, because of the way that we're, they were taught, they often treat their data, their data sets as static because that's what they were taught in courses. That's what most online competitions focus on. It's also what most of academia focuses on. So often papers are about squeezing the last bit of performance on common static benchmark data sets and not necessarily about augmenting your data or changing your data. And lastly, it's what most tools are being built for. However, I want to argue that data sets should not be static. So as an example, um, I participated in a Kaggle competition once. It was the Data Science Bowl of 2017. And the goal of this Data Science Bowl or this competition was to predict whether someone was likely to get lung cancer in the following year based on a CT scan. So I happened to be working at a company at the time which did this as a product. So we built a product that analyzed lung CT scans and uh, determined whether there were abnormalities in the lung. And because of that, we decided to participate in this competition as well. But also because of that, we knew that the competition that we were participating in, if we were just focused on the data that we were presented with, was impossible because the data a lung CT scan, a CT scan of the abdomen, is actually a 3D volume, so it's about 300 images of 500 by 500 pixels. And the labels that we were provided with was just, will this person get lung cancer or not? Whereas in practice, the amount of data that we were given, 1,300 scans, is not nearly enough to solve that problem. 
And even if we had more scans, it's, it's just too complex to solve it in by straight up forward, putting it into a convolutional neural network and getting a prediction out of that. So our company decided to participate in this competition and we actually ended up in third place. And it also gave us the opportunity to look at what other solutions were, what other, other participants had come up with. And it turns out that all the top scoring solutions basically completely disregarded the data sets that they were given. So the second place solution by Julian De Witt, uh, together with Daniel Hammock, um, they said for this solution, so for this data science bowl, the engineering of the train set was essential, if not the most essential part of their solution. And why is that? Well, I won't dive too deeply into how to do this specifically, but essentially if you have a 3D CT scan, you can't just say, does someone have lung cancer or not? What you can do, however, is try to find abnormalities in the lung, as you can see here, and then classify those abnormalities as potentially malignant or not. And then if someone has a lot of potentially malignant abnormalities, then that person is pretty likely to get lung cancer. So Julian, the second place solution, he described that he used five different data sets in order to do this. And uh, none of them were actually the original Kaggle data set. So um, not only did he use data sets that he found online, but he also generated automatic tables, employed active learning, and even created his own special build tool, fewer to debug the labels and manually select interesting case samples. And that was a very similar approach to what we did as well. Um, so a lot of effort went into the labeling and the labeling quality uh, and creating a representative training set rather than tuning network parameters. And the key thing to note here is that it was not about getting more data, it was about getting better data and recognizing that the data that we were given was not sufficient to solve our problem. And that brings me to a slightly more recent competition, the data-centric AI competition. So the data-centric AI competition uh, ran for six weeks in September 2021, and the central topic here was data-centric AI. And data-centric AI is described as the discipline of systematically engineering the data used to build an AI system. What this meant for the competition was this. So the model was fixed, but the data could be changed. So what does that mean? Well, uh, we, had a, we had a fixed model, a ResNet 50. We could access and run it locally, but we had to submit the data uh, to the competition and all the compute was handled on the challenge site. One of the things that I really liked about this was that it made it way more accessible to participate as well, because you didn't need any beefy GPUs to, comp to compete. You simply needed about 10 MB of storage space and an internet connection, and you could submit your own version of the train and the validation set. Because on the challenge side, they were handling everything model related. Next, this competition was about Roman numerals. So we had handwritten Roman numerals of about ten, one until 10, as you can see here. And this is what we had to classify. In total, we were provided with about 3000 images in a given train and validation split. The validation split, split was used for early stopping, so that was an important part. And we were also provided with a label book with, exact, with uh, examples that we could expect for each uh, class. And the task at hand here was to enhance the training set or enhance the data set in such a way that the performance on the fixed model would improve. We were limited to five submissions uh, per week over a six week period. And an important restriction was that we were not allowed to submit more than 10,000 examples. So we participated in this as well. What did we do? Um, so I participated in this challenge together with my colleagues Rens and Ru. And the very first thing we did was uh, to use low tech tools to get started together. So we quickly found out that Google Sheets actually allows us to display an image uh, if you provide it with a URL, which very easily allowed us to go through the data in a collaborative way. 
So we created a pandas data frame with the URL of an image and some additional information, such as the file name and the subset of the data. And we created some scripts to very easily import and export this from Google Sheets to pandas and so forth. So we did this because it allowed us a very collaborative way to improve label quality, which is the first step towards creating a better data set. So we improved label quality in the following way. Uh, first of all, we extracted the predictions on the images uh, for the baseline ResNet50 model. So these were the predictions if we didn't change anything. Um, so no alterations to our data just yet. And this allowed us to focus on discrepancies between the model and the ground truth. Uh, and because we were using Google Sheets, we also imported the confidence level of the model uh, that, the confidence, uh, that the model had in our predictions. And we could very easily just sort it by confidence to uh, focus on the most clear mistakes that were being made. However, um, we then had to overwrite those wrong labels. And we found that the solution that we tried at first to just discuss and override it uh, when we reached the consensus was not always the right way to go about it. Because it turns out that even with just three humans in the room, there's still a lot of need for discussion about certain data samples. We often disagreed whether something was a two or a four or something like that. And it was just taking way too long to go through all the data if we had to discuss every single sample. So because we had 3,000 samples, uh, this took way too long, so we decided to go about it in a slightly different way. And that is that we created separate sheets, and everyone individually and went through the sheet, which was very easy to do, because you saw the image and you just pressed, well, this is, this is just crap, or this is a one, or this is a seven, etc. And we combined those different sheets into one representation where we could see the different annotators and also focus on the disagreement. So if all annotators agreed, if all three of us agreed, it was automatically overwritten with the label that we thought it should be instead of the original label. And if we didn't disagree, we could discuss the examples, but we ended up throwing out most of those examples where we had a discussion about. If we had a discussion and it was taking longer than three seconds, we said this is clearly not a good example. If we can even agree, how can we expect the model to learn? And that taught us something very important. And that is that the labeling is the learning. The process of manually going through your data gave us so much better understanding of the problem at hand uh, that it allowed us to decide what to do next. First of all, we noticed that some data points simply didn't belong in the training set at all. So these were some of the examples of data points that we got and that the, con the model was not very confident on. And these noisy data points just needed to be removed altogether our uh, model would be better off without them. We also learned that a lack of consensus between annotators was pretty much always about the same classes. So we would often confuse sevens for threes and twos for sixes. And maybe more importantly, we also noticed that there was a distinct difference in writing styles in the data set, something that wasn't labeled at all, but by going through the data, you notice this more and more. So you see the column of numbers on the left here, which are all threes, and the column on the right are all sevens, but they're written in a clearly different way than the other examples. And this led us to notice something maybe even more important. And that is that there was a big, big difference in distribution between the train and the validation set. So you see here some samples from our training set, and these were some samples from our validation set. And it turns out that the first way of writing was way more common in our train set, whereas the second way of writing the numbers was way more common in our validation set. Just by analyzing you know, uh, the classes and how many samples belong to each class, we wouldn't have noticed this, but by going through the data manually, this becomes very apparent. Uh, and this can actually prove, uh, prove to be a problem as well. So what did we do next? Next, we used embeddings to get a sense of typicality and style. We passed the data again through ResNet50, our baseline model, to get predictions as before, but Instead of focusing on those predictions, um, we removed the head of the tasks where the features extracted from the image by the convolutional neural network are converted to an output prediction. 
and we end up with embeddings, uh, numeric values that describe the image. So think about it like this. In the last layers of the network, before these values, these embeddings are converted to an actual prediction, it would be logical to assume that embeddings that represent an image of a tree will be more similar to each other than the embeddings of uh, a different picture uh, of a nine, for instance. So we got those embeddings, but we wanted to visualize them. However, these are highly dimensional, so we can't just visual visualize them outright. So we had to use some form of dimensionality reduction to get back to two dimensions. In this case, we chose UMAP. So we performed UMAP on our embeddings and decided to visualize this with Altair, specifically because the Altair library also gives us some really nice interaction. So let me see if I can run this. I think we can, yes. As you can see, the tooltip allows us to uh, display the specific data points as well. And the data points, as you see them here, are colored according to the subset of data they belong to, the train, validation, or label book. And as you can see here, it seems like the left quadrant of the data is represented in the train set, but not necessarily very heavily in the validation set as well. And this was confirmed when we visualized them separately. As you can see here, um, the data, by plotting them separately, the, the problem becomes more clear. The distribution of the data in the training set and the validation set is not the same. And how can we expect to get a good model if those distributions don't match up? So that taught us our second lesson. Don't be afraid to rebalance the train test split. We were given some train data and some validation, and it would be easy to just keep it the way it is, but sometimes it's a good idea to change data points from one set to a different set, so rebalance it. Next up, we had to actually improve our data set. So we cleaned up some of the, uh, some of the labels, but how do we go about creating new data points? Well, First of all, an obvious one is going for data augmentation. So we have the, the obvious data augmentation methods like scaling, cropping, uh, rotation, etc. But one that we focused on a little bit more was actually specifically creating counterfactuals. As you can see here, we created a relatively simple Streamlit app with the Streamlit uh, drawable canvas. And that will allow us to, <laughs> you can see the balloons, um, to create new data samples from other data samples. So by taking an existing data point, you can alter it in such a way that, for instance, what used to be an eight represents a one or a two or a five, etc. And the idea behind this is that we wanted to focus on the kinds of mistakes that the model was making. So if it often confuses a two for a four, for instance, why don't you show that difference by making a counterfactual? So this allowed us to create new data quickly, and it was most interesting for images that our previous model found quite hard. So for those eights that were misclassified as sevens, for instance, we would take the eight that was misclassified, also create a seven version of it by simply removing one of the eyes, and that would be a counterfactual to help guide the model to learn that, no, this is what a seven looks like, and this is what an eight looks like. It should focus not on the style, but it should focus on the Vs, the eyes, and the relative positions of those. <coughs> and that taught us our last lesson. Um, invest time in creating additional tooling that allows you to quickly change and iterate over your data sets. Collaborating here was not a hassle, but because we wrote some scripts that would automatically save the files to the right folders, uh, so our folders were divided in such a way that the folder called 7 had all the images of a 7, the folder called 8 had all the images of an 8, etc. And if we overwrote something in our Google Sheet, we said this should actually be a 7, not an 8, the file would get moved accordingly. Uh, so we didn't have to bother with that. And we also didn't have to manually change every picture. We could just upload it to our, have, have this streamlit canvas and uh, draw on it, and it would, again, save it in the right places. So it took a little bit of time to create this tooling around it, but it wasn't too much of a hassle, and it saved a lot of time in the long run because we could very easily try out different data sets and see how they performed. This allowed us to focus on what we wanted to focus on, 
which is the data. And that actually worked quite well for us. Um, we were one of the winners in the most innovative category of the competition. Uh, we didn't actually have the best performance. That credit goes to uh, some of the other teams, like Inotescus, uh, Synaptic Anne, and Divakar Roy. Um, so it might be interesting to also discuss what the best performing teams tried and what they focused on. So those three best performing teams all had slightly different approaches. Um, so the first team by Synaptic Anne that ended up in third place, they mostly focused on generating a lot of data and then restricting that all those augmentations to the 10,000 most relevant ones. So first of all, they did some manual data cleaning like most of us did, um, but they also did some manual data generation. So they asked friends and colleagues to just write Roman numerals for them and that gave them extra handwritten Roman numerals. They also used automated data generation, so uh, specifically auto-augment uh, they investigated, used some, some parameters to choose the best augmentation techniques, and then used filtering by vote using an ensemble model um, or multiple models and just voting on what the best ones were to restrict from the 70,000 images that they ended up with to the 10,000 best ones. If you want to read more about their approach, that's on the link here. That will be the case for all of the competing teams. The second team by Inotescus, who ended up in second place, um, they didn't as much focus on creating a lot of different images and then restricting them to the 10,000 allowed, but they were actually mostly focused on rebalancing that train and validation <laughs> split. So they very quickly noticed with their, their tooling that there was quite a disconnect between how the different classes were internally balanced. So you see that in some classes, a lot of, there were a lot of uppercase letters, whereas in other classes, there were a lot of lowercase letters. And also between the validation and train set, this varied a little bit. So the way that they created new data was by detecting these uh, imbalances and then creating data augmentation specifically on those cases where that were underrepresented in that specific class or in that specific um, subset of the data. So for instance, if there were not a lot of lowercase letters, letter ones, uh, they would take the lowercase and create the augmentation specifically on that data sample rather than in the uppercase data samples. Um, so that landed them in second place. And lastly, uh, Divakar Roy's approach, that was again focused on a completely different part of the data set, which I thought was quite interesting, where they noticed that there were quite a lot of different types of noise in the data set. So you can see here at the top, these are all the types of noise that you could encounter in the data set. So what they decided to do was separate the noise from the actual number and then create new samples to have all types of noise uh, nicely presented in all for all classes and all parts of the data set. So they used data augmentation to augment their individual numbers and then overlay that on a noise canvas so you have a different version of that noise with a different version of the number as well. And this actually uh, won them the competition. So why am I talking about this? Why are we doing this data-centric AI competition, whereas previously the most famous competitions are more like Kaggle competitions? Why are we doing a competition that's really only just focused on altering the data and keeps the model fixed? Well, that's a valid question because the idea that focusing on your data is an important thing to do is not new. I mean, one of the first things that I learned was garbage in, garbage out, right? Uh, and monitoring your data to discover errors or uh, applying uh, other techniques uh, like active learning that actually dates back decades. So why do we talk about it now and why is it called data-centric AI? Well, in order to illustrate that, I want to remind you of deep learning, which is something that really had its revival in 2010. The idea of deep learning wasn't new. So deep learning has been around for a really long time. The first perceptron was created in 1958. I mean, backpropagation, the paper about that was, what, 1986? And I've seen papers about applying uh, convolutional neural networks on X-ray images back in 1994. So the ideas behind deep learning aren't necessarily very new. 
but there is something that changed that caused it to rise to prominence and uh, be as important as it is today, somewhere around 2010-ish. Things changed, so we had more da large annotated data sets available, we had better compute available, and it really meant that even though the ideas were around for longer, deep learning as we know it today pretty much started in 2010. So why would that also be the case for data-centric AI? The idea that you should focus on your data. We know this, there are techniques that we could use that we've known for ages. What is different now? Well, the first, and I would say almost most important thing, is that models have become more user-friendly and commoditized. And we, as data scientists, simply don't have the resources to compete with this. Look at models like GPT-3, BERT, and large ResNet models. The architectures of these models have an incredible number of parameters, um, and it is completely infeasible for most of us to create and train those from scratch. Typically, we also don't have the huge data sets available to us that they were trained on. However, because of transfer learning, we can still use these pre-trained models and fine-tune them on our own much smaller data sets. And it is being made increasingly easy and automated to do that, to use models out of the box. And that means that the competitive advantage of data scientists is in everything that surrounds the models. So that could mean defining great metrics, or discovering systematic errors in your models, or even just shipping your models to the user. But a very important part of that is the data, because the data is unique to your use case. Improving the data can, uh, can be easier and have more impact than improving the model or the algorithm. Second, it simply improves performance. In these three use cases, as you can see here, tinkering with the model led to almost negligible results or increases in performance, whereas tinkering with the data led to a huge increase in performance. And as you can see here as well, uh, performance on clean representative data is simply better than models trained on noisy data. Uh, in this particular case, that means that training on 1,500 noisy data points gives you about the same level of performance as training on 500 data points. Um, and that becomes particularly relevant for your small data problems. And yes, you can just collect more data. Why don't you just collect a thousand more samples and then you don't have to bother with cleaning. Uh, but even your big data problems are often small data problems in the long tail. For instance, when you consider a chatbot, um, sure, there are questions that your chatbot will get asked very frequently, like, oh, I want to change my address, or something very common like that. But there's a huge, huge amount of questions that you just don't have a lot of data for, because just a couple of people ask it. So you better make sure that that data is good. And lastly, remember this image. Um, tuning the network parameters is often a very individual exercise. Choosing the right architecture, choosing the right number of layers, choosing the right model is a very individual thing to do, and it's very hard to talk about or get advice on. Whereas focusing on the data, like we did here, we were able to collaborate as a team. And data is much easier to talk about than models. And this is true for data science teams amongst themselves, but it's also true for those other people, other stakeholders that might have very relevant insights, such as end users or subject matter experts. For instance, an example, uh, when we were working on lung cancer detection, a very important part of lung cancer detection is whether something is malignant. And a very good indicator of whether something is malignant is the type of nodule or abnormality that it is. So, what did we do as data scientists? We built a huge convolutional neural network, threw in our 3D data, and expected us to give, it, give us good results. But it turns out that we actually didn't have a lot of data. We had a lot of solid nodules data, but we didn't have a lot of ground glass nodules data, which meant that our network was really underperforming on ground glass and part solid nodules, which were the most important to detect correct. So, Luckily, as I was working in a company that focused on this, we had an in-house domain expert, a doctor, and I went up to him and said, hey, um, can you have a look at, my, at the results of my model? Can you see some patterns here? And 
see what kind of mistakes it's making. Because, you know, I'm not a certified radiologist. I, I'm pretty good at reading nodules at this stage, but I didn't, you know, I'm not the expert. And he didn't even look at the data. He just said to me, why are you building a model? And I was like, what do you mean, why are you building a model? I need to know which of these three things it is, so I'm building a model to get that information. But apparently, what radiologists do to assess whether it's a solid, part solid, or ground glass nodule is just eyeball the amount of white pixels. Um, so if he told me if all of them are white, it's solid. If half of them are white, it's part solid. And if, you know, almost none of them are white, it's ground glass. That was a bit, didn't turn out to be a great heuristic, but together with our domain experts, uh, together with the doctor, we we discovered a good heuristic that was able to properly classify whatever we needed here. Even though our neural network did not have enough data to learn from. And another example is, which is not a conversation with the domain expert, with, with one of the end users, is that our model simply picked up abnormalities or abnormal tissue and apparently, when you ship a model to a user and you ship it to a radiologist, they get really annoyed when your lung cancer detection software picks up abnormalities in the liver, because that's not lung cancer, obviously. Um, so based on that feedback and based on a conversation with some of the hospitals that were running our models that uh, were so kind to, to help us out with this, um, we created a lung mask to filter out any abnormalities that may be located or detected outside of these areas. And it was in collaboration with our domain uh, expert, our in-house expert, our doctor, who told us, yeah, you can't actually put it around the border there because a lot of abnormalities are at the border exactly, so you need to have a little bit of wiggle room over there. Um, yeah, so... In this case, th those conversations helped us to create a better product, but also to not filter out too much. This is all to say um, that focusing on the data enables better collaboration between the data scientists, but also other involved parties. It helps create a better shared understanding. Because this is what we want to avoid, that we have a solution where we say, I solved the medical problem by simply looping over a bunch of settings. Hopefully, as a data scientist focused on the data, you go back to the hospital and actually get out of your ivory tower and talk to these people, and that's much easier to do when you talk about the data than when you talk about the model parameters. So we talk about data-centric AI, and what does that mean? Well, Andrew Ng states that having 50 thoughtfully engineered examples can be sufficient to explain to the neural network what you wanted to learn. So the focus has to shift from big data to good data. What does good data mean? Well, first of all, although it might sound very obvious, it means consistent labels. Um, it might sound obvious, but it's not always the case. Sometimes that's simply because of unclear instructions, as maybe you can see here, where someone was instructed to label or put a bounding box around the cups of coffee. Is that one big bounding box or two smaller bounding box? but sometimes it's simply a little bit more complicated. So say that you have a comment like, people still p eat at Pizza Hut, gross. Is that a toxic comment? I mean, it's not a nice comment, but is it, over, is it, is it toxic? Um, what does it mean for a comment to be toxic precisely? And every task is like this in one way or another. I've seen this in uh, medical image data sets as well. Well, we had a really, really good medical image data set where the data set was annotated by four different radiologists who each all had individually 35 years of experience under their belt. And you would simply not believe how often they disagreed, which is a little bit unfortunate, but all right. Second, another characteristic of good data is that it is complete and representative. So imagine that this is your data set, right? So this is your training set. It's a pretty good example of bananas, but it's not a great example if this is the kind of example that you will encounter in practice. We've seen this in the Roman numerals data set where the distribution between the training set and the validation set did not match up. And lastly, we also need the data to be unbiased. 
So a model trained on biased data will in itself also be biased. This is often the case for language, but also for images, for instance, and other forms of data. So we really want to avoid a situation like this, where uh, completing a sentence with this man works as a mask ends up with lawyer, carpenter, doctor, and the same sentence with woman ends up with nurse, waitress, teacher, and even prostitute. <laughs> However, luckily, part of data-centric AI is also to develop tools that can help detect these biases. Take, for example, Revise, a tool that was um, presented at the data-centric AI workshop at NeurIPS last edition. Not only does it provide you with uh, possible inequalities in your data set, this is on image data, um, but it also is very actionable because you can see what kind of data you're missing, so it guides you how to do your data collection. If you collect more data, what areas you should focus on. That also means that data collection should be an iterative process. So how do we get to data-centric AI and where do we go from here? So we know now that the focus uh, is shifting from what we call model-centric AI to data-centric AI because advancement in the field has mostly been about scaling larger and larger models that are infeasible for individual data scientists to create and train. And models are being more commoditized and easier to use, use which means that a competitive advantage for data scientists in, is in everything that surrounds the model and particularly the data that is unique to every use case. But how does a movement like this, and it is a movement, how does it develop? Well, it of course starts out with some individuals that take an interest. Like, like I said with deep learning, there have been techniques around this topic for around for ages. Um, deep learning that always have, uh, uh, was always around, the ideas were around for a really long time, but it didn't really gain widespread appreciation until around 2010. Um, and the same goes for data-centric AI. Uh, before it had a name, uh, there were several people that embraced it. Um, then a term is coined, um, and you can see that it gets more adopted. We had the data-centric AI competition, we had the data-centric workshop at NeurIPS, and we have conferences about it. Oh. And lastly, we have systematic tools that are being developed. So that's the stage where we are in now. Tools are being developed. You can see these papers that were created. We have these companies that are around now. And um, it's not just academia taking an interest, it's also companies. But what if you say, I like building models? Does that mean that data-centric AI is the way to go and model-centric AI isn't necessary anymore? Are we just gonna become data cleaners rather than data scientists? Well, don't despair. First of all, the balance between model and data-centric AI uh, swings back and forth. Uh, so the reason why the uh, deep learning could advance in the first place was the availability of large data sets and tools that made them possible. And currently, improving the quality by improving the model is much more difficult than improving by using techniques that manipulate the data. But that might change over time. And if you don't want to wait, uh, we are in dire need of tools that make it easier to iterate over the data, and models play a huge role there too. So there's enough for us left to do. That being said, I'd like to thank you all for your attention, and thanks for PyData London for organizing. We've got limited time, but two or three questions we can handle. Thank you. Um, uh, very great talk. Thank you very much. Um, when you said that you disagreed between you and your colleagues on like, uh, what, numer uh, yeah. what the numerals meant, and also in a medical uh, application, mm -hmm. right, and doctors disagree, what's your like first go to strategy is it to remove these labels is it to um uh, you know augment them like clarify them uh, edit them so that they uh, fall into one or another another class what is the best uh, that's a very good question. So in the case of the Roman numerals, we decided to just get rid of them because we had a restriction of, of 10,000 samples that we could submit. So we wanted to submit the most clear samples. In the case of medical uh, data, that was a little bit different because 
uh, th there's simply not as much annotated medical data around. So what we decided to do there is give a higher weight to the data points that were very clear and a lower weight to the data points that were a little bit ambiguous. One of the most re remarkable things in your excellent talk was a quotation that we should move from big data to good data and that in certain cases, perhaps a binary classifier, we might only need 50 good examples. Where does the number 50 comes from and how do we know what it should be? That's a very good question. Um, first of all, that quote, it wasn't a quote by me, it was a quote by Andrew Noon, so I don't know where he got that from. I don't want to take credit for that. Um, second of all, I think that does depend a little bit about the complexity of your problem. If you have a very simple problem that you're trying to solve, 50 examples is good enough. And then if you have something like 3D medical lung cancer data set, I don't think you'll ever have enough with 50 examples. But I think what it mostly illustrates is that we don't necessarily need as much data as we used to because we used to need a lot of data because we needed to train all the models from scratch. And if we're just fine tuning, it's more about fine tuning on the right data than it is on a lot of data. Thank you.